Welcome to Decoding DX. We're a group of fourth year medical students with a passion for education and patient care. This episode of Decoding DX is for educational purposes only and should not be used as medical advice. Please consult your healthcare provider for any medical needs. The opinions expressed represents those of the participants and are not of our affiliated institutions. Thank you for joining us on Decoding DX. We keep learning so much through this experience, and we're so glad that you're learning alongside with us. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome everyone to 10 Clinical Minutes. Today we have a presentation on refeeding syndrome, which traditionally is thought of as, uh, in medical school at least, something that isn't very prominent in a lot of the patients that we treat on a daily basis, but you'll be surprised. As you get into more and more clinical situations, refeeding syndrome becomes prominent in way more uh, patient situations than you would have previously thought. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, First off, just kind of a big picture view of how refeeding syndrome works. We're not going to go through each of these points right now, um, but this is kind of what this whole presentation is going to be about, um, is kind of what's the pathophys, uh, how do we get there, and what is refeeding syndrome? But the big uh, takeaway uh, for this entire presentation is that this all relates largely to insulin and the effects that insulin has. So to start off with, you have chronic malnutrition. And the degree of refeeding syndrome is going to be related to the degree of chronic malnutrition. So some different medical conditions to think about in your patients uh, that may put them at risk for refeeding syndrome. These include eating disorders, Um, Just anyone who's elderly who may not be eating appropriate amounts for their nutrition on a regular basis, anyone with cognitive impairment that may not be able to voice that they're hungry or that they're not getting enough nutrition. Um, Oncology patients, they have a really high metabolic rate, largely because of their their cancer. Um, And on top of that, they may not have much of an appetite because of the treatments they may be undergoing. So they could be chronically malnourished. And then any sort of malabsorptive disease, it makes it pretty difficult for those patients to absorb the nutrients as you would expect. And then anyone who's critically ill, um, as many of you may know, it's pretty difficult for us to get nutrition sometimes for critically ill patients um, because of aspiration risk and the risk associated with TPN. Um, And then chronic alcoholism. And then, of course, refugees and other people that are in socioeconomic situations where it's difficult for them to get adequate nutrition. So what does this look like from a physiologic standpoint? We know that when someone is in a state of starvation, they have high glucagon and low insulin. Um, And those are really what's going to be driving a lot of this whole process. So as you would imagine, in a starvation state, it's primarily breakdown of nutrients. So breaking down of any residual carbohydrates that you have. Once you get more advanced into the starvation state, it's primarily breakdown of fats. There's a couple, you know, various different parts of the body that really need any glucose or any sugars that are available. So if there's any carbohydrates, they're going to be shunted into those things like the brain, um, the kidney, the medulla, and the red blood cells. Um, But eventually get to a point where you just don't have carbohydrates available. And that's when um, ketosis really takes over. Um, You also have breakdown of protein in order to feed gluconeogenesis so that there's some of that sugar available for the brain that really, really needs it. So you're going to have breakdown of muscle to to create that, that energy source for the gluconeogenesis. And then you're also going to be consuming all of the micronutrients that your body needs. So the big ones that we think about with that are thiamine, iron, folate, um, and then all sorts of the other things like the zinc, um, the other B vitamins, the vitamin D, the vitamin C, all those are limited sources in our body. Their body can't store infinite amounts of those things, especially the water-soluble ones are kind of hard to store. Um, And over all of this, our body is able to slow down our metabolic rate and turn off some processes uh, such that our metabolic rate is only about 30 to 50% of normal when you get into advanced starvation state. So if you have someone in this state from any reason, including the ones that we mentioned on on the previous slide, and then you go into a rapid refeeding. So this means that, you know, all of a sudden, this person's able to get the nutrition that they need. And you may think, awesome, great, you know, let's feed them, let's get them better, let's rehabilitate the nutrition. But if we do that too rapidly, we get into a lot of trouble. So why do we get into trouble? When you have a flood of nutrients, your body sees that as a flood of sugar. And what does sugar trigger? It triggers insulin. And what does insulin trigger? Building, anabolism. Um, let, let's reshape all this stuff that we've had to break down for all this time for being bound nourished. So some of the, the big nutrients that we're going to be seeing um, integrated into this process. Potassium. Potassium is critical 
for a lot of the co-transporters that we learn about for maintaining membrane potentials for any cell membrane that requires some sort of polarization, which is pretty much all of them. <laughs> and, but then there's certain ones that that potential is extremely important, such as neurons um, and muscle cells and heart cells, things like that. It's also a critical co cofactor for a lot of enzymes. Similar for magnesium, some of the major metabolic enzymes that are going to be suddenly triggered to turn on by this insulin require potassium and magnesium. So those are going to those nutrients are going to be shoved into the cells to try and enable these processes that are being turned on by the insulin. Another big one to think about is phosphate. Um, we talk about ATP all the time in biochemistry, and that P is phosphate. And so phosphate is critical to be able to power all of these processes that are going on in order to build back up what the body had been breaking down for so long. And then finally, thiamine is critical for ATP synthesis because of the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle requires thiamine. And so when you have the when you, when your body sees all of this this energy source, it wants to use the most high output process available to make ATP which is the Krebs cycle and that whole, you know, aerobic metabolism. And so it's going to suck in all the phosphate to be able to, to fuel the, uh, the formation of all this ATP to be able to do what it wants to do, which is build back up the body. However, because we had had this total body depletion of all of these nutrients, there's this mismatch between what's available and what the insulin is telling the body to do. And so suddenly, because this is happening rapidly, we're going to have a massive intercellular shift of especially those three big electrolytes, the potassium, magnesium, and phosphate. Because the insulin is saying, hey, it's party time. Let's get this going. We have nutrients. Let's build back up. So let's suck all these nutrients into the cells. But we know that our serum uh, and our plasma level of these electrolytes is critical to maintain the right balances of what, uh, what our bodies need, need to be able to function and to be stable. And so as those electrolytes shift so rapidly, we start to get chaos. Some of the big things that we see initially, as the potassium is, goes in, the sodium comes out. We know that the sodium and potassium are very connected with a lot of the exchangers. And so as the body is sucking potassium in, it's shoving the sodium out for the, with the same process. And we know that what follows sodium? Water follows sodium. So we get massive amounts of edema and fluid retention. Also, as the body is trying to make all this ATP in order to build up the muscles and the, uh, the proteins and the lipids and everything else that it wants to build back up, that thiamine is exhausted pretty quickly. As there's a limited amount of thiamine in the body to begin with, and then we're sucking all of it up really quickly to build ATP, that glucose is then going to be shunted to the lactic acid process. Because if there's no thiamine available, the Krebs cycle can't go on. And uh, we know with the anaerobic metabolism process, that when the glucose can't go aerobic, it goes anaerobic, and that creates lactic acid, which, as we know from sepsis and all sorts of things, too much lactic acid can be very dangerous. In addition, a lot of the, the insulin processes and the electrolyte processes increase our angiotensin II and our norepinephrine, which causes vasoconstriction, so we can get really variable blood pressures as well. Again, creating just this kind of all-out metabolic chaos when nothing's really communicating with each other. So that's what leads us to re refeeding syndrome. So the, here's a list of kind of the, the, the more common symptoms and signs that happen when we have this unregulated rapid refeeding. The big ones are in red, so the big ones that we worry about. Seizures are huge. Seizures are kind of one of the big bads that we want to watch out for. Bradycardia and arrhythmia are also obviously could be lethal if we're not careful about it. In this situation, you will see patients with resting heart rates in the 30s, and these could be otherwise, you know, young adults that otherwise uh, shouldn't have any heart problems. They could have these terribly low uh, heart rates that could very easily go into arrhythmia. As we talked about earlier, the muscles are highly involved in all these electrolyte shifts and the protein breakdown and buildup. And so you can get pretty significant for abdo, which as we know, can then affect the kidneys and cause acute kidney injury. And then finally, because of all the metabolic processes and the shunting with the glucose to the lactic acid and stuff that we were talking about earlier, we can get pretty profound metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis to compensate. So how do we prevent this chaos? If this is so dangerous, how do, we, how do we stop this? The best thing is prevention. So knowing risk factors is the most important thing so that we can prevent this repeating syndrome from happening. So there's a couple different um, objective risk factors that we can look at. So obvious one is how underweight is this person? If they've been chronically malnourished for a long time, are they significantly underweight? There's minor, major, and high risk classifications of BMI. But that's far from the only thing to, to watch out for. Because if someone um, was, you know, obese or overweight, 
and they were malnourished for a long time, they might look like a quote unquote normal weight, but they're still critically malnourished. And so percent of weight loss over a duration of time is also a really, really important risk factor in addition to the duration of malnutrition. So if someone was, you know, just feeling really ill and not eating very well, very well for a few days, you know, they're, they're at some risk for refeeding syndrome. But if that starts to turn into 10, 15, 20 days, they are at very high risk for refeeding syndrome. To get a clear diagnosis of refeeding syndrome is kind of tricky. There's not really a clear consensus on how to define this in the literature, but the general consensus is look at the signs and symptoms and watch those electrolytes. And like we said, it's the potassium, magnesium, and phosphate. So in someone who you think might be at risk, how do you prevent this? Big things are, like we said, prophylactic supplementation. So supplementing with thiamine, folate, multivitamins. That is critical as you're starting to refeed these, these patients. If their electrolyte levels are already low before you start refeeding them, replace those electrolytes first. We don't want them to have to catch up and be at higher risk for some of these massive shifts. Other things are to be careful about IV fluids and fluids by mouth. You want to not overload them because like we talked about, sometimes that with that shift, the sodium can come out and you can cause fluid retention and edema. There's also some risks for like some cardiomyopathy and heart failure in extreme cases. So you want to look at your patient, don't have ever have a blanket approach to IV fluids, but you want to achieve and maintain adequate hydration and fluid, fluid balance with IV fluids as is appropriate based on your clinical status. And then finally, slowly graded nutritional rehab is the best way to prevent this. So what I mean by that is really involving your nutrition and your pharmacy colleagues and setting up a, you know, when someone comes in with malnutrition, we're not just going to like feed them everything that they could possibly imagine. We're going to say, okay, on day one, we're going to feed you this amount. And then on day two, we're going to slowly increase that daily and daily and daily. So we can work up and let their body slowly adjust back to having nutrition and having normal levels of insulin so that we don't get that sudden surge of insulin that just kind of throws everything out of whack. And a lot of dietitians are so good at this. They can set out a, a wonderful meal plan that can look at the amount of calories that we want to give this person to rehabilitate their nutrition in a way that's safe and healthy. Also, monitoring is huge in refeeding syndrome. So you always want to base on EKG. Because like I said, the bradycardia and the arrhythmias are some of the most dangerous complications of refeeding syndrome. So you want to know what they look like baseline so that we can monitor for changes. And then we want to watch their vital signs. And the frequency of this really depends on how stable they are. So initially, you're probably going to put them on telemetry for, for a little bit, at least to just kind of make sure that they're stable. And then after that, depending on their stability um, and their location. So we know that we can't normally do vitals every hour on the floor. They can do that in the ICU. But once your patient is stable enough to be on the floor, doing Q4 vitals um, and then continuous overnight, continuous heart monitoring is generally an approach that is safe to take. Daily weights, uh, you want to be careful with this because obviously we, in, in a lot of chronically malnourished patients, they are underweight. We want them to gain weight appropriately, but if it's too quickly, that could mean fluid overload. So we'd want to watch that. And there's all sorts of resources you can find online for watching how much uh, weight you would expect and want to gradually gain day by day. And then you want daily electrolyte levels uh, with the BMP, the mag, and the FOS for at least four days. And then if there's any sort of shifts in those electrolytes that you're starting to see, you would then extend those daily measures um, beyond four days and even making them more frequently than daily if you're concerned. You can make them every four hours, every six hours to really make sure that we're watching those shifts um, if you're really concerned about your patient. And then finally, if refeeding syndrome does happen, um, if despite all of our efforts, the prevention just didn't quite prevent it, you really just treat according to the complications. There's not any specific treatment for refeeding syndrome beyond what you would do to treat what's happening to your patient. So to sum up some key points, high index of suspicion, like a low threshold of suspicion. So refeeding syndrome and anyone who hasn't had ideal nutrition in the recent past, um, whether or not they look like they're underweight, whether or not they look like they're malnourished, if your patient has not been getting good nutrition for at least a few days, they are at risk and you need to keep that in mind. Carefully watch the potassium, phosphate, and magnesium. Those are the three electrolytes that are really dangerous to shift quickly in refeeding syndrome. The biggest threats for some of these symptoms is cardiac. That can kill your patient immediately. So watch that EKG, watch that telemetry, uh, watch that QTC, and be careful with what the electrolyte shifts are doing to your patient's heart. You want to slowly reintroduce nutrition. The best treatment is prophylaxis here. 
So if we are able to slowly uh, readjust their body to having nutrition, having insulin, that is the best way to prevent repeating syndrome. And finally, interdisciplinary teams are the gold standard. The best way to approach this is to have multiple heads thinking on the problem, thinking on the patient that think differently that we, so that we can keep our patients safe as we rehabilitate their nutrition. Finally, here was a key reference uh, that had a lot of the different objective and diagnostic data and other things just came from my clinical experiences. Thank you for joining us on this episode of 10 Clinical Minutes. Hope you learned a few things. Uh, please contact us if you have any questions, actions, or concerns, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.